the butterfly effect includes some sexually explicit material, and so it's not suitable for everyone. Stories can start when you least expect them. This story started for me when I happened to see a man glance at a woman. Nobody was supposed to notice the glance, but by chance, I did. It happened in a Los Angeles hotel lobby one evening in January 2013. The woman was there to meet me. She was a veteran porn performer, and I was interviewing her for a different story. The hotel receptionist telephoned my room to tell me that my guest was waiting for me in the lobby. I went downstairs and spotted her straight away. Her dress was bright blue and very tight. Everybody else in the lobby was dressed in inconspicuous colours. She seemed so otherworldly, like a great mad peacock. I walked towards her. That's when I noticed the glance. It was the hotel receptionist. I just happened to swing around as he was looking at her. It was a look of total contempt. It made me think that some people are only comfortable with porn people when they're on their computers and not in their vicinity. And with disgust comes in curiousness. So I became curious. What were their lives like? What were their concerns? I began researching. And it turned out that a lot of them were concerned about the same, very specific thing. A man called Fabian. This series is about what happened because of Fabian. <clears throat> Shall we start? Sure. Uh, Fabian, maybe the first thing um, you should do is just introduce yourself. Just, just tell, me, tell me your name. Uh, I'm, I'm Fabian Tullman. Uh, yes. <laughs> How much do you want to know? <laughs> uh, that's good for now. I will, I will eke more out during the questioning <laughs> process. <laughs> This series tells the story of a butterfly effect. Back when Fabian was a teenager in Brussels in the 1990s, he had an idea. Because of that idea, some people in Montreal eventually started to behave differently. As a consequence, other people down in the San Fernando Valley started behaving differently, and so on. For a year, I've been tracing Fabian's butterfly effect. If I kept going, tracing consequence through to consequence, where might I end up? To give you an idea of the places that I do end up, by the end of episode two, a man in Norway will be paying some women to set fire to his stamp collection. By the end of episode four, a child in Oklahoma will be forced to move to the edge of town. And by the end of episode five, a man will lose his life. But first, Let's go back to the flap of the butterfly's wings. Fabian, a teenager in Brussels. I, I was the best example of a geek, no question whatsoever. Like, yeah. I know that to the youth club I went like, what, once a month maybe. And <laughs> all the cool guys in the class were there all the time, right? Instead, Fabian gravitated to a place where young introverts felt comfortable in the 1990s. CompuServe, there was an internet giant back then providing primitive forums for strangers to chat to each other. I started talking to people there, and uh, being uh, a young guy, I uh, started checking out uh, stuff that had to do with porn. Okay, so uh, chat rooms where you would trade uh, access to porn sites without paying for them. Okay. So on CompuServe, you started like trading porn pictures with other people. Passwords, never porn pictures. No, passwords. Much more, more uh, efficient, you know? Instead of one picture, you just trade a password and you get all of them from the site. It's much easier. <laughs> oh. This was the flap of the butterfly's wings. Fabian trading free porn. Because an idea began to form. Maybe he could get rich by doing this on a massive scale. Fabian couldn't have legitimately signed up for porn sites even if he'd wanted to. He was 16. I didn't have a credit card. That, that was the main reason. Uh, I probably wouldn't have paid if I had one, I agree. But uh, no, it, it was a sport too in the end, right? Actually, swapping porn passwords wasn't only a sport. It was also a way for porn users to avoid embarrassment in the 1990s. 
it started with credit cards that you had to call in. So you had to call some switchboard and give the number. I got to say, if you, if you had to like, phone up a switchboard with your credit card details, that is the last <laughs> thing that an ashamed man who wants to watch porn <laughs> would, would want yes. to do, right? It seems a bit iffy, I agree. The 1990s became the 2000s and the online porn world continued to be primitive. Porn entrepreneurs were falling way behind, Fabian thought. We were watching music videos for free on YouTube, but internet porn was still basically shrouded behind paywalls that were guarding ungainly websites buried clumsily in places that most people never look, like page two of the Google search results for the word porn. The fact was, the porn world was there for the taking, not by some gangster or porn devotee, but by somebody techy, like Fabian, who was in his mid-twenties by then. Tell me if I'm right with this assumption. Uh, so a lot of the kind of porn entrepreneurs back then, there were some kind of mom and pop type companies, sort of, you know, went passionate porn enthusiasts. And then you had some kind of shady moguls. But you had something that none of them had. You knew how the internet worked. Yes. They were all relatively small. All of them were very, very happy that they made, I don't know, let's say quarter million a year in profits, if even. Because before that, they worked at some grocery store or whatever, and, right. you know. So this is the kind of people you had a lot. And they were doing what they loved, which was filming each other having sex. Yes, exactly. Of of getting laid by girls that they wouldn't get laid to without paying them to film having sex. Right. There's a Jewish phrase, dieno, like that is sufficient. <laughs> and then, yes, and exactly. then you came along. Right. Yes. Fabian knew he couldn't start from scratch. He needed a foothold, so he went searching for a porn company to buy. That's how he discovered Mansef. Mansef was like no other porn business. It was still a fledgling company, but it was being professionally run from inside a sleek glass office building in Montreal. It was created by a couple of family members and some friends from university. It was very family. I mean, as a, as a fun example, the head of HR, she actually, many years before, 10, 15 years before, she was babysitting the CEO uh, when he was younger, you know? Right. So this is how close these people were. There was something weird about the Mansef company website. It was that it basically didn't say what they did. It still doesn't. It's like they've purposefully chosen respectable, even soporific phrases to describe themselves, like world-class infrastructure for unmatched reliability and performance. In fact, Mansef had recently invented Pornhub, which was YouTube for porn. YouTube for porn. So YouTube, just the same logic, videos uploaded by people that are basically porn videos. Made money with ads. That's it. Just like Fabian in the CompuServe chat rooms, porn fans would steal their favourite porn and upload it onto Pornhub. The infringed upon porn producers would demand that Mansef take down the stolen content. Mansef would dutifully comply. This was fine by Mansef. The takedown notices were a drop in the ocean. Users were illegally uploading the porn way faster than the ill-equipped producers were demanding it be taken down. Sometimes the stolen porn would be back up just a few hours later. It was a bonanza for people who didn't want to pay for porn. Even in these earliest days, Pornhub was getting a million hits a day. Fabian told Mansef's owners that he wanted to buy their company, and they said that they wanted to sell. One of the reasons why uh, the old owners of Mansef wanted to sell was that their parents didn't know. So <laughs> their parents had no idea... What they did. At least not in detail, what they were really doing. What did they, were they lying to their parents? Uh, they were, uh, they were, were doing stuff on the internet, right? They had websites, <laughs> which ones were not that important. They had websites and it was working well. They didn't want them to know. So they had code words in the office, 
whenever one, someone came from the family that wasn't supposed to see anything, they would go on the floor and yell that word and they would all <laughs> shut off their, their stuff and go somewhere else. So their parents didn't know that they were running what was soon to become the biggest porn empire in history. Yes. That really was Fabian's plan. And he understood that to achieve it, he needed to headhunt Montreal's smartest tech people to handle all of that user-uploaded porn, most of it stolen, and make it algorithmic and search engine optimized. One of the smartest young tech people in town was called Brandon Retty. I started working in mobile technology back in around 2005. So just to kind of put it in perspective, that's when phones were were, were still kind of black and white and flip phones and, and all that stuff. So Snake. Snake, yeah. Snake was still a, still a pretty, uh, pretty cool game. There weren't a lot of people who worked in mobile at that time. I got an email from, from the headhunter for, for that company and they were kind of cagey in the email, not exactly telling me what the company was. When they eventually told Brandon what line of work they were in, he was wary. As he put it to me in an earlier conversation, he thought that, quote, only degenerates work in pornography, and he didn't want to be seen as a, quote, piece of garbage peddling smut. I had just kind of got my degree from a really good university, uh, McGill University here in Canada, and I, and I was thinking, I'm like, is this, is potentially working in this industry going to sully my career? You think of like who works in the adult industry and you think of some sleazy guy holding a camera and like a boom microphone on a set. And when I went in for my, my first interview, I didn't know what to expect. And I ended up um, at, a, at a very inconspicuous office building with a bunch of nerdy dudes walking around wearing like dress shirts and, 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 and jeans. It's a very nondescript uh, glass building. And the inside is just, it looks like it's blue, gray, and it looks like any office you would go to with a bunch of cubicles and a bunch of offices. So describe, describe the nerdy men. Yeah. So, I mean, like, look, think, think Facebook, you know, think Google, think, you know, tech, tech guys. Yeah, you know, if you would walk into their offices today, unless you stumbled on the wrong floor, you would not notice what they do. Uh, because you have a huge amount of support people, you have a huge amount of SEO people, uh, search engine people. You would not notice. Uh, it's quite impressive. Brandon was put in charge of building Mansef's fledgling mobile division. If you have ever watched Pornhub on a smartphone, you have Brandon to thank. And you also have to thank for enticing you with immaculately data-analyzed category thumbs. On Pornhub, the porn is divided into categories. Asian and blowjob and teen and so on. Each category has its own front page photograph. Brandon and his team would put three or four alternate photos through, quote, continuous A-B testing to find out which of them converted the best. They might be almost identical with just the hint of a change in facial expression. You have a, a cell phone and there's a, you know, a guy who lives next door to you has a cell phone. Um, essentially what we do is we send different versions to different people. You know, you reach a level of statistical significance. You can determine that, you know, if we use version A, we will see 10% more clicks. So we then send version A to the entire population. And then we do another A-B test until, you know, you, you, you test and you test and you test until you've, um, you know, until you've reached a kind of limit of, okay, well, we're not gonna get any better than this. The old dinosaur porn companies down in the San Fernando Valley weren't performing data studies of the nuanced vagaries of eroticism and turning them into actionable insights. And so Pornhub had almost no competition and began to grow exponentially. Millions of porn fans were starting to get all of their porn for free from this one site. Brandon wasn't focused on the fact that so much of the porn he dealt with was stolen illegally uploaded by fans. His was the world of data analysis, and through data, he discovered unusual things. I believe it was Monday mornings was the most popular time people would be looking at them at, at porno pornographic content, and it's like... On their mobile phones. On their mobile phones. Like, where is someone generally on a Monday morning? And it's usually work. in the office, at work. You know? in the bathroom at work. In, potentially, yeah, or in their office, or, you know, under their desk, or, or something like Not that. Not under yeah. their desk. In well, you never, I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> not, not under their desk. We would see these spikes in, in usage. And I believe the spikes on the web 
were actually on Sundays. And where are people most often on Sundays? Well, in church. Um, in the bathroom but, at church. Well, no, because they'd have their laptops. Ah. So, you know, I, I'm talking about the web now. Oh, but, so you know, the, they'd be home, the you other know. family members are at church. You, yeah, you never know. It's funny to hear Brandon's voice light up at the memory of his data analysis. He and his co-workers truly were not in this for the porn. And the way I, I explain it to people is like, if you work at the Mint and after two weeks you still see money, you probably shouldn't be working at the Mint. All I saw was 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 modals and advertisements and 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 kind of dollar signs where you know where they should be. You know, and um, my guess is that most people at Mansef never set foot on a porn set. Um, I would say ninety five percent of people, maybe even more, didn't. After Fabian bought Mansef, he changed the name to Man Win. He conceded that this new name might have sounded ominous to the porn women down in the San Fernando Valley. The women that nobody at Montreal HQ ever came across unless they stumbled onto the wrong floor and noticed what was happening on the screens. But Fabian swears that the name was not meant to sound ominous. I'll be very honest, believe me or not, not until much, much later, I realized that if you split the two, it says man and win. It was really, really not in any shape or form <laughs> went like that. Really not. It's just a coincidence, I guess. It just sounded nice. Right. So we used that, had an M in the beginning, perfect. Now the company was his. He went looking for a bank loan to help him expand. He was pessimistic. Like me, he'd read stories about how women in the porn industry find it hard to convince bank managers to even give them checking accounts. That's a loan. Loans. As you said, a porn star can't get a current account. And their logic is that what if someone else that has an account with us figures out that a porn star has one and then wants to leave? And these are all people, right, that go to these sites every day that decide this, just so we are clear. Considering the fact that we had 280 million people a month from the US on, the site, on these sites, it kind of leaves not many of them left. So basically, a porn star will go to a bank manager and say, can I have a bank account? And the bank manager yes. will say, no, because you're a porn star. And then the bank yes. manager will go home and watch one of, the, <laughs> will watch exactly. one of their Exactly, now he knows your name, so he'll try to find some more stuff. Yes, they watch, exactly. So basically, like they're, they're okay <laughs> with the women as long as they're inside their computer, but not when they're sitting exactly. in, in their vicinity. Yeah, this is always the case like this. But Fabian had an advantage. He was a male entrepreneur with a resolute will and a lot of tech expertise. All of this would surely be enticing to some bank or hedge fund. It took a year and then it worked. Uh, and, and it was a company was... called Colbeck Capital gave you the money, right? Yes. And it gave you $362 million. Yes. Crazy. Fabian went to some venture capitalists or investment bankers and were like, look, and he was like, look, I have this crazy business. I just need gasoline to throw in the fire. And he borrowed that money so he could go and he could buy competition. He was able to take Manwin and put a very clean face on it. He sold it as a blossoming tech company. I bought pretty much everything that was for sale but and was useful to buy yeah, because there's also a lot of crap. But uh, I, I bought a, a bunch of stuff. Fabian bought Playboy TV at the porn production company Digital Playground and YouPorn, which had been Pornhub's biggest free porn competitor and twisties and gay tube and red tube and on and on. Some people have said that, that the main reason why you got to buy all the paid sites is because they lost so much money because of the free sites. So it's like Pornhub sort of makes the San Fernando Valley crash and then you go into the crash and buy up the paid sites for cheap. Well, I, I think I took advantage of the uncertainty that people were afraid of this to happen. And uh, therefore, yes, uh, in the, uh, this uncertainty definitely was created by me. I'm not hiding behind that. There's no need for me to hide behind that. I don't think that's uh, bad in some way. It's a business decision. It's a business, uh, business strategy in the end. Still, it is not a great world where a porn woman finds it hard to open a checking account because she's judged unrespectable, whereas Fabian get a $362 million loan to build an empire based in part on the handling of those women's stolen porn. Now Fabian owned free sites and paid sites. He had created, as Brandon had put it to me, a vacuum of re-energizing. 
I was in charge for the mobile tubes division and a friend of mine, Yannick, was in charge of the mobile uh, pay sites division. So what that means is I was in charge of Bornhub, Uborn, Tube, Keys Movie, Spankwire, and, 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 and a bunch of other ones. And he was in charge of browsers and mofos. And essentially what we would do is we would use the tube sites to promote the paid content. And you have this kind of washing machine effect where the whole company is kind of doing well because the, the tube sites are promoting like the, the paid site content and, and also selling ads. Fabian bought Mansef in March 2010. By 2012, by his own calculations, 80% of everybody in the world who watched porn was watching it on one of his sites, mainly Pornhub. So what kind of numbers are we talking about? In 2013, roughly 65 to 75 million people each day. So like more people would go to one of your sites than would go to like, I don't know, ESPN or... Uh, yes, CNN and so on. Yes. Right. When I started, there was three people on the mobile team, four people maybe. When I left, I had a team of 50 people working with me. Like every Monday, we'd have like 70 people starting. And almost none of them ever set foot on a porn set. You know, the content was filmed in the, the Valley and, and never in uh, never in Montreal. And there was really a separation there, which I think was actually a, quite a good thing. Why, why was it a good thing? I don't think they would have been able to recruit as many people as they did if people, you know, were really on set. You, know, you were hiring tech nerds, you know what I mean? That's really what it was. You were hiring people to program. You were hiring people to, to do data analysis. You were hiring business intelligence uh, analysts. You were hiring designers, you know? They were designing the packaging, right? It's like most people would not be comfortable on an on a adult set. That thing you said about the separation between what you were all doing up in Montreal and the porn sets down in the San Fernando Valley and mm-hmm. how that was healthy, I can think of a way it may not have been healthy, which was... It means you weren't confronted with the potential negative consequences of all of that free porn, that kind of monopoly. Yeah, so, you know, their their livelihood. Um, look, um, businesses change and you need to be able to adapt. Technology is, is constantly going to change people's lives. And you cannot hold back technology just because a small minority of people are going to be affected by it, you know. You know, would you say that YouTube shouldn't exist, John? Like, we, like, um, we, <laughs> I think it's inevitable, as you say. I think it's inevitable. But just yeah, because it's I, inevitable doesn't mean there aren't negative consequences. Sure, um, but I think the good outweighed the bad. So, did you, did you get rich during this time? Did I get rich? Yeah, it depends on what you mean by rich. No, no. I, yes, I, I think in any standard, uh, I, I you would say that I became rich. Yes. Yeah. So what kind of car do you drive? Uh, I have uh, right now only, quote unquote, uh, uh, four. Uh, I had uh, 18 before, so <laughs> it changed wow. quite a bit. Uh, I still have sports cars, of course. I like fast cars, no question whatsoever. Um, I had uh, McLarens. Have you ever thought about the kind of butterfly effect? Because obviously when when Pornhub became so huge in the late 2000s, there must have then been a a butterfly effect that would then engulf the existing porn world in the San Fernando Valley. Did did you ever think about that stuff? A lot of people in the industry made less money, there's no question. I do not know how many companies closed. I'm sure many did. To be honest, I, there's, there's, it's hard for me to say what else there might have been. I, I have talked to a lot of people, and I know that a lot of people are upset about uh, how this all developed and how it is continuing today. Right. But uh, yeah. So the I, main I, thing was the kind of movement of money, I guess, from the San yes. Fernando Valley up to Montreal. Yes. <laughs> yes, you could say that. that. That was definitely the biggest change. Yes. You know, how, how do you feel about me going down into the San Fernando Valley and trying to find out what the real butterfly effect is. And and would you be curious? Yes, uh, of course it would be interesting. I thought I'd be going to the San Fernando Valley to tell some kind of financial story. But as my months there progress, a different story emerges. Something sad and funny, but also warm 
and strangely beautiful. Here comes the ketchup. Oh! <laughs> no. <laughs> Never. I don't ever think of a 10-year-old kid when I'm shooting porn. He wanted it all shot from the front, and I shot a segment of it from the back. I might as well have made him a video of, you know, the grossest thing. He has had this stamp collection for 40 years, and we just accepted it and burned it. <laughs> Two years ago, there was a Catholic priest who killed someone in Europe, and it was all over the news there in Italy. It was an Italian priest, and he murdered someone and went to jail for it, and they searched his house to figure out why, and on his computer was nothing but religious porn of mine. It is strongly urged to never refer to her by name again. They ought to just constantly refer to her as the victim. I got caught up in it too, that we were cool. People like us. No, porn people like us. The real world does not like us. The Butterfly Effect is written by me, John Ronson. My producer is Lena Misitsis. The music is by Joel Ronson. The sound engineer is Kristen Mueller. The editor is Mike Olive. The senior producer is Lucy Greenwell. Eric Newsom is the executive producer. This is Audible.